Okay, okay. we're right ready. Here. So, uh, last session of the day oh, no. um, is uh, from a guest speaker, Norman, <laughs> who uh, a good friend of Brian, and uh, decided that we thought this would be uh, something uh, a bit different, a bit off the wall, and uh, but uh, you know fits well in the sequence that we've done this afternoon. So, Norman. Green is going to come and talk to us about closed circuit televisions for the UK military in the 19 late 1930s. Over to you, Norman. Thank you. Can we get them off, Brian? Good, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I've been doing... I found a photograph in the museum at Bradford uh, about three years ago of a television camera that I had never seen before and because I've been mad on television since I was about seven years old, the first book I bought was when I was seven, um, I started to do some research in it. And this is the sort of culmination of the work into that photograph. It concerns EMI. EMI was formed in 1931. It was the, um, sorry, I'm just going to work out this pointer thing. Yes. Um, it was the Depression, and business was bad for the record companies. So HMV and the Columbia Graphophone Company amalgamated to form electric and musical industries. And a gentleman called Isaac Schoenberg was appointed head of patents and research. He had been head of patent in Columbia and it was rena renamed EMI Research Laboratories in 1932. Now, he was a very remarkable man. He was a Jew. He was born in a village called Pinsk where his father owned a timber yard and it, Pinsk is in the, what is now Belarus, but in those days was the greater Russia under the Tsar. You probably know that the Jews were persecuted under a program called the Pogrom, and they were restricted in which the schools they could go to, etc. But Schoenberg, oh sorry, wrong tit, managed to get a place at the Kiev oh med he managed to I think I'm going to use this pointer so that I can just concentrate excuse me uh, he managed to get, obtain a place at the uh, Kiev Polytechnic Institute a technical institute where he studied physics and mathematics and when at the end of the course he graduated and was presented with the gold medal for mathematics. The only problem was that he couldn't get a job because of his nationality. So he in actual fact went to work farm. And then a friend of his said, shall we set up a company making spark radio transmitters? And in Kiev, they formed a company called the Russian Wireless and Telegraph Company. And they were quite successful. And so they moved to St. Petersburg. And they provided... ...as military. And... But the... Oh, persecution still went on. And so, in very early 1913 he sold his part of the company to Marconi's the wireless telegraph company and came to Britain and after a short while in the patents department at Marconi's he went to the Columbia Graphophone Company where he surrounded himself with a, a rather great um, very clever group of engineers in 1930, when he was at EMI, he was head of the television development, obviously, and here's the research building at Hayes, and I'd just like you to look at this. There's people working on an aerial there, and that aerial transmitted television pictures generated in, 
in the auditorium of this building and they were transmitted and you probably all know this famous place and they were received at Abbey Road in London, in St John's Wood because it was much easier to take the opinion formers from the west end of London to Abbey Road than to bus them 12 miles out to Hayes and back. And here is Schoenberg in 1934, or 35, sorry, um, saying goodbye to somebody who I've never been able to find who the guy is. But he's obviously a civil servant or something with his Homburg. Now, in 1935-36, Emmys were working on their television system and they had dis this is a camera channel uh, from 19 late 1936-37 because it's got a viewfinder on it, uh, the power supply, the pulse generation and the camera control equipment plus a monitor. This was to be installed in June, July, August in Alexander Palace ready for the shootout between Baird and EMI. And here you see Birkinshaw, the chief engineer of the BBC television with a prototype, a very early uh, ME camera because it doesn't have a viewfinder and it's got the short necked image on pickup tube. And this was the sort of picture that it was able to produce. This is an off the screen photograph. Now, in March 1936, this is before really they were installing the equipment at Alexander Palace, the head of the Royal Air Force, Sir Hugh Dowding, wrote to Schoenberg asking him if he could make some proposals for a light television transmitting set for use in aircraft. Schoenberg wrote back and said he'd like a meeting. It was arranged that in August that year, Emmys would take down to Farnborough, and this is Farnborough's Blackburn monoplane, a camera and some sort of camera control unit and a monitor and they went up and they pointed the camera out of these windows and they thought that the results were good enough that they would make a complete television uh, channel. In September, this is when they were really working hard to get the Alexander Palace installation going, Schoenberg wrote this very interesting note to the Air Force about the fact that they could do a pilotless aeroplane with a television equipment in it and that they would control the aircraft over a single channel with 20, up to 25 channels in that channel and I have done some research and I believe that this predates Time division, electronic time division multiplex by a, but anything between 15 and 20 years. They also propose that the effects of um, compass, airspeed, onto the corners of the pickup tube so that they could see remotely what was going on and pilot the plane if there was fog or something like that. So this is a pilotless bomb they were proposing. So we'll look at the airborne reconnaissance system. It was to be put in an Anson aircraft of this type um, and here, I've only obtained this about a week ago, it's a drawing of the Anson and why I want to show you it is that here where the bomber aimer is, is a window where he looks down and that is where the camera will go and back here is the radio set and that is where the CCUs will go with the transmitter and SPGs along here. Here is the plane 
with a diagram. This from the original file, the camera is up here and it is remotely controlled to two positions, one looking vertically down and one looking at a board which facsimile drawings can be put on. Here is the master north compass that was transmitted in the signal. Here you have the transmitter, the SPG, the control of the transmitter, waveform monitor and uh, a picture monitor with camera controls and they could also put a camera in the gun turret. Uh, this was never fully engineered and the other thing is of course you've got a transmitter, you've got to have an aerial but you can't have the aerial sticking out when the plane's on the ground so the aerial was in and once the plane was airborne they lowered the aerial down the tube. Sorry, oh well. Now here is the complete set of equipment. You've got a long necked emitron with the cover over the lenses. You've got the transmitter, the pulse generators, the transmitter controls, waveform monitor, camera controls and this is the power unit. This I found in the Imperial War Museum five days ago and it shows you this is where the, CC, the CCU transmitter control units were put and the transmitter and SPG was on a table along there. Now the camera looked out where the bomb aim by RAF at Hendon but when I really got it you can't there's no bomb aimers windows so again a week ago at the Imperial War Museum I was able to find this photograph the glass window where the camera would look down. The airborne television camera was had two lenses 6.5 for looking at the facsimile and 12 to look at the ground very interestingly, it was 405 line sequential scanning at 25 pictures a second. Now, the reason they did this and not interlace scanning because, was a, because of the vibration on the camera tube. And therefore, if it was vibrating with an interlace, you'd get blurred between one frame and another. Whereas with sequential scanning, and God, you, what you've got to remember is we never did in broadcast in sequential scanning until we really went to high definition television. It's quite remarkable. Just, ah. Here is the camera with its cover on but you can see the anti-vibration mountains and the gimbals and everything trying to uh, get rid of vibration and the two uh, camera cables remote con and a remote control to swing the camera went in here and here. It used the standard Emitron camera tube and for those of you I don't know, I'm in a society that I don't know what you know, it used this Emitron camera tube, the iconoscope, where basically you have a photosensitive mosaic and you scan it and the, the a mica plate on which has been, been deposited photosensitive cesium active, activated silver oxide with loads and loads of globules on it and at the back is aluminium paint which they then connected to to take the output signal so that when the electron beam went across these little capacitors effectively that had been charged up by the light they were discharged producing a signal that was then amplified. Here is effectively the guts of the equipment, the SPGs, the transmitter controls, waveform monitor, picture monitor with camera controls, the tubes were mounted vertically and then viewed on a 45 degree mirror. Now you might say, God, here is the camera channel, six of which were going into Alexander Palace 
at the same time as they had designed this airborne equipment. Difference. What made the difference between this huge great piece of equipment and the, really the quite miniaturised equipment? And for those of you who know about shading, they had already designed automatic shading circuits for the airborne equipment. It is the Acorn valve here. Invented in 19, late 1935 by RCA, here it is compared with a U52 valve, roughly the same size as most of the valves that they used at that period. Here is its valve base. I'm indebted to Brian Summers for loaning me these <laughs> valves. Um, here is the mountain. As you will know, it has little pins coming out through the glass uh, pinch sort of circle here and they go into uh, spring clips. Now it's very interesting in the National Archive I have read the report by a very famous scientist to Churchill R.V. Jones. R.V. Jones was sort of Churchill's counterbalance to Lindemann and he goes to inspect the equipment <coughs> in 1937 and he was concerned about the effect of vibration on these spring clips, which is an interesting point. But the, in the trials, they didn't have that, any trouble. Um, here, a pentode and a triode, the full complement of valves that a circuit designer wants to be able to design electronic circuits. Here is the transmitter. 50 watt transmitter with a fan to cool it and here is the airborne power supply. Now the transmitter frequency 50 megs, 50 watts, had a range at 5,000 feet of 50 to 75 miles and a range over sea of about 100 miles and the total weight was 304 pounds. Here is the plane with the, as I say, with the aerial and everything in it, that was transmitting the pictures from here down to the ground and it was received on an aerial. The equipment was in an army trailer and here you have the power supplies, the RF receiver and the monitor, monitor and then there was a cable going off to another monitor, we'll talk about that in a minute. Here is the aerial, as you can see, it had, was 2 foot 10 in length and one of the things had, it had spark gaps for um, lightning protection, etc. In a bit of trouble? There we are. Here's the receiving equipment, power supply, uh, the RF receiver and the monitoring, both picture and waveform. Now these are pictures taken off the screen when the plane was flying over EMI's Hayes factory. What is interesting is to see that that is the research building and that is the prototype so that they could get, they, they duplicate, they replicated the distances that they would have at Alexander Palace from their transmitter across the yard and up the mast and that's where they spent hours matching the feeder to the aerials so that they didn't have any reflections. That's a bit of byproduct. <laughs> um, just a minute. There we are. I was to stand here. Here is a facsimile tra oh. Here's a facsimile transmission of a map of the Isle of Dogs and the Thames going through. So the other display is over here and this is quite an interesting uh, piece of equipment. It's a remote, it's a remote viewing unit. These two leaves like a table come up so that the person looking at the pictures from the aircraft can relate them to maps that they put on this table 
And as I said to you that they were transmitting with the picture a north indicator to give the bearing of the aircraft. And therefore, if you wanted to keep the north indicator sort of pointing up the screen uh, so that you didn't have to move the maps around, you crank this handle and this handle turn the scan coils round the tube <laughs> to keep it dead north. Interesting idea. Now we come to the naval part. That was the, the trailer was used by the army at Lark Hill for gunnery trials and they did gunnery trials and everything with the cameras and that. Then the Navy came in and they had equipment and they chose HMS Iron Duke. Now I know that something's happened at the next slide uh, with my PowerPoint presentation so I'm going to point them out. You have to believe me. In fact you can see it. Just up there and just up there is that, the aerial. They had two aerials on the boat. That's where you would have seen enlargements, but it seems to disappear. Now there's an amusing story. This is the receiver that you've seen before, but there's an amusing story about it because in the archives, it took about four months, would you believe, in 1937 for the Admiralty to come to an agreement with EMI about the paint that this would be painted in. <laughs> um, of course, Emmys were going to do it, in those days they did a, a sort of, like a, a grey, you know, you'd probably call it today battleship grey. But it wasn't the right grey for the battleship of the Navy. So they had to go to a lot of trouble of getting the British standard colour and everything and getting the painting to paint this for the Navy. I ask you. It gets worse actually. Um, just to tell you that the terrible problem, well, well I come to admit, these are photographs of the facsimile transmissions from the aircraft over um, the area outside Portsmouth. You can see that there's some destroyers here and something up here but there's another one where you can see two flotillas up here and something's going at 20 knots etc. One of the problems is there's no uh, description in the National Archives of what this is. But this is the one I really like because it's got all these destroyers up here, right? There's nine of them, I think. There's uh, five battleships. There's an aircraft carrier. There's an oiler. There's some auxiliaries down here. And there's this huge lot of cruisers. We haven't got enough ships, have we? <laughs> I don't think we've got enough ships. I mean, we were showing off to NATO. We only had one ship to send down to Cardiff Bay. And the Russian government asked if they could have a set of equipment and 12 months had elapsed since they'd first asked. So they first asked before the equipment was actually proven and the war office said no you can't do it so Schoenberg writes again 12 months later can we do it no I can t the, is the answer then in 24th of January 1938 Schoenberg's asking because the Czechoslovakians want to buy some equipment but the answer was no the only people the Emmys were able to sell the equipment to were the French the French had two sets of equipment and I want to try and follow that up one day. Um, but you might say, well, what's happening because it's 1938? One of the great problems was the actual trials of this equipment took place in May, June and July 1939 because it had, it had uh, taken the Air Ministry from October 1936 to May 39 
to supply an Anson aircraft for EMI to put the equipment in. <laughs>